Welcome everybody to the Dr. Leadership Leadership Lounge, where we have conversations with business leaders from all walks of life about how and why they are successful. Well, first of all, everybody, I'd like to uh, welcome to the show uh, Dick Vermeil, NFL Super Bowl winner, coach of the year, uh, has been involved in the broadcast industry for decades as well. Uh, extremely successful man that likes to go by the name of Coach. And first of all, uh, Coach, I just want to welcome you to the show. Thanks for joining us. Oh, well, thank you. Always fun to talk leadership. That's right. That's right. Well, I appreciate you coming on today. And, you know, I wanted to touch on a couple things. Uh, I want to make sure we get to your your leadership principles, which are going to be very impactful to the audience. But really wanted to, to kind of start and, and go back and talk about your coaching career. You know, you're from the kind of Napa Valley or, or uh, wine country of California. And right. you've hit all aspects of coaching from high school to uh, junior college to college to professional sports. And, you know, I think the only coach that was coach of the year in all four segments, both high school, junior college, college and professional, which that's not uh, that's not limited company. I think you're the only company <laughs> that that's yeah. pulled that off. But, well, but I, tell me that. So but I just, I just go along with it. <laughs> That's right. You're you're blessed and surrounded by great people, like you said the other day. Yeah. What what led you to coaching? Kind of a basic question, but what what enamored you about that, or or drew you towards that? Well, what you know, I think for most people, coach any sport, it's the sport itself that they enjoyed playing and competing in that you know, created the uh, desire to get deeply involved in. And what happened to me was. First off, my dad loved football. He always thought high school football was was great for him, and it, it taught him uh, the principles of uh, leading a, a life as a man should correctly with the structure, the discipline, and the get up and go to work when you're bumped and bruised and all these kinds of concepts. Yep. And, uh, so that was always a positive. But my senior year in high school, a new young coach came out of college to take over the uh, little team in Calistoga High School, 130 kids in the school, and he really impressed me. He really did. And, he, you know, one day he said to me halfway through the season, he said, you know, Dick, if you wanted to, you could play college football. And I hadn't really planned to go to college. And uh, I was going to stay. My dad was going to build a new garage for Meal and Sons Garage. Okay. Yep. And uh, that's that's excited, man. You know, I love to play the game. And he said I could play in college. I said, I'd like to try it. So I went to junior college. And then I, I, I stayed in touch with him and my goal was, hey, if I get out of junior college, get into college, then I come out, I could be an assistant coach for him at, at, at a high school as he moves on. So that's how it all started. And then uh, I uh, took a, got out of college, got my master's in general secondary, having played football at San Jose State. Yep. And, uh, uh, by that time, uh, he had moved to a bigger school. And then... Uh, uh, I went as an assistant my first year in 1959 at a high school in San Jose. And then the next year I became a head coach. So I, I didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, go to work for my high school coach. Okay. Yeah. I went a head coach on my own. And then from then on, every time someone offered me what I thought was a career move up, I took it regardless <laughs> of hurry, whatever it was. And my wife went along with it and we just kept moving. And so we're very fortunate to experience success at different levels and all of a sudden find yourself coaching at a level you, you really never anticipated coaching in, but it was exciting. You know, when you, every year you work at it, you become a little more uh, passionate. I decided, you know, I didn't want to teach in a classroom or physical education. Yeah. I want to coach. So that I just kept moving in that direction every time someone talked to me about a, a different job. You know, that's how it all happened. Yeah. You know, it's funny you bring that up about teaching. So when I was in high school, I was not a uh, a big kid then. Um, you know, I was 150 pounds wet, <laughs> six foot and 150 pounds of string bean. Played, you know, mm -hmm. defensive back. But the reason I played football was because Coach Bankus was one of my favorite teachers too. You know, he was just so impactful. We had a, a, a class was called Man in Society, and it was four men teachers, two Vietnam vets, and two coaches. One was a swim team coach. And the other was the head football team coach. And we studied all these great people in the world, you know, Mother Teresa and, and Elvis and JFK. And, and the insights that those four gentlemen gave to the classroom really kept everybody not only engaged in the classroom, but also in the sports they led. So yeah. I, I really appreciate you saying that somebody was impactful for you. What, what was it like coaching height? I'm sure it's a big difference, but 
maybe not so much then, but coaching high school kids and then moving to the college level and then up to the pro level, what's the interaction like? It, was it similar? Today, it's much different, right? High school or college coaches many times aren't successful in the pros and vice versa. Was there big leaps and bounds in how those relationships worked uh, when you were coaching and changing those levels? You know, I enjoyed every level of, uh, the same. I enjoyed my high school team as, as a head coach as much as I enjoyed my college team and my pro teams. You know, they're all people. Yep. They're all human. They all have specific needs. And sometimes they're individual people that have individual needs. But I really enjoyed the relationship part of all of it. And uh, I, I didn't find it that much different, though. I think you become a little more sophisticated as you grow yourself as a leader. Yep. You know, you automatically go from high school to college or, or to NFL and uh, communicate with the same uh, approach and everything else that you did with the younger kids, you know, but hey, you know, I've always said, you know, NFL players are still kids. They're just bigger, faster and they get paid to play. <laughs> you know? There's a lot of truth I in that. that. You know, and I, I it was never a drastic problem change for me. You know, I was fortunate that way. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, it, it, that has really changed a lot today. I think you'd probably agree with that, that coaching at the pro level, it's it's a lot more about the me than the we. You know, the team has lost some of it. It's about the superstar status, it seems like. Yeah, what's changed so much in the NFL is the evaluation process as, and the number of people in the business doing it. You know, it's crimey now. There's When I was at even my first NFL job, you know, the media, kind of the press conferences and all that yep. were – Big, I thought, but now they're gigantic. Yeah. It was all these different sources of communication, electronic world has magnified the intensity of the evaluation process. So I think it requires you to be a better overall, uh, I would say, communicator. Yeah. And you, you work a little more diligently at connecting properly and you edit what you say a little more sophisticated, you know? Uh, yeah, because everything can be today more so than ever evaluated in, in, in different ways. And, and you've got to be very careful. Yeah. The loss of context. We, I talked about that on a, one of the podcasts here a couple of weeks ago about communication and, you know, texts don't have, or emails sometimes don't have the appropriate context. People can misunderstand that you're angry, upset, concerned, being short, whatever. And then yeah. in this world today, you're always on camera. I mean, the, I always have said it's a good thing there weren't all these phones and things when I was growing up because I, I'd have never been able to get a good job because of all the <laughs> the coverage of me today. It's a microscope uh, on these players oh, every single day. You know, and all you know, these different, uh, what it call, I don't even get involved in it, you know, Instagrams to Twitter, uh, all right. this stuff. Oh, jeez. It's amazing how big it is. Yeah, it really is. Um, it, so th I talked on the show, just a, a factoid for you. You know, the Library of Congress, it took 250 years to fill the Library of Congress with all the millions of books and millions of periodicals and everything that it, yeah. it contains, images, videos, etc. That much data moves on the internet every 1.6 minutes. I mean, that yeah. <laughs> it just blows your mind, you know, and yeah. it, it is just crazy. What now, I know your father was inspirational to you because you said, you know, he had a had a garage and he worked on automobiles and it was going to be yeah. for Meal and Sons. Was he the most influential kind of um, person you looked up to or was there anybody else that was really important in your life? It sounds like your high school coach well, was important, but. You know, and I realize it more today than I did then. He didn't even finish high school. Okay. Yeah. He was, he was an intense personality, an old fashioned dad, you know, was no way to misunderstand him. Okay. <laughs> it was, uh, there was just one way and it was how he expected his family to lead their lives and live, uh, you know, ethically, morally, uh, integrity wise uh, and all that uh, stuff uh, it was always uh, very important to us. And your work ethic, you know, he was the guy that taught me that hard work wasn't a form of punishment. Okay. It's what you do to make a living. It's how, how you solve problems. It's, it's your, your, you learn, learn to use work as a solution, you know. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so he taught me that. I got my work ethic from him. My mom was a real compassionate lady. It wasn't, she, she was always doing something for somebody. That that's wonderful. Her. That's wonderful. 
Well, and you've given back so a lot had, too. Yeah. And my dad had close friends, uh, Mr. Frediani, Gene Frediani, uh, who I still pick his vineyard grapes for our wine business. And yeah. He was very influential on me. My dad's closest friend and a couple other guys that started me hunting when my dad didn't hunt, but they would take me hunting because they didn't have boys and these kinds of things that were all uh, very beneficial to my growth as a young person. You know, it's kind of the village mentality. You know, we don't have that any longer. I, I didn't need yeah. to worry about if my dad saw me misbehaving, it was the neighbors that I needed to worry about because oh, they wouldn't stop hitting on you, you know, their father to you, you know, there was, yeah. Uh, Everybody was involved with you, you know. It's so, a, it's uh, a lost art, you know. My my dad had his own business, and he was very influential to me. I, I unfortunately lost him. He was a World War II vet, and I was a late late child, so I was reared by uh, really a generation and a half older than all my friends' parents were. Yeah, and <laughs> you know, I have a brother that's uh, that's eighteen years older than me, and a sister sixteen, and a sister eleven years older than me. And oh. I look back at it now, and I'm so thankful I was you know blessed with that upbringing. He used to always say. Um, I only uh, only expect you work half days. You pick which half, seven to seven or seven to seven. <laughs> right. It was just hard work. And his name was on the building, yeah. and he'd be the one sweeping the floors. You know, he led by example, yeah. and it sounds like your father was very similar. Uh, so many, I, you know, you can forget advice. You can forget what you read, but you very seldom forget real good examples. That's a great point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they it's amazing. I'm, I, I spent... Since nine o'clock this morning in my office, cleaning it up, I hadn't done it and I, I didn't get nearly as far along as I wanted to, but, but, and everything, I see something that reminds me of something. I see a picture that reminds me of something. I got pictures all over that remind me of different people and, and events. Yep. And, uh, and fortunately they're all positive. They're all free reinforcement centers. And that, and that and sometimes it's a distraction maintaining your concentration on what you're doing but it's a good distraction yep it's a it is. well reminiscing you're going down memory lane back. right yeah I, I walk yeah i'm in memory lane every day at my age especially that's yeah. great that's that you know that's absolutely wonderful my dad was the same way it's uh look back and be and be happy it was kind of funny my dad was very direct uh you know you never wanted him involved um yeah uh, mom was the yeller and dad yeah. would, you know, once the, the child had had enough, whatever we had done, dad would say, I think that's enough. And then it would shut down. And, but they were, yes. uh, they were tied at the hip and, and yeah. uh, great examples. And I'm very fortunate to have siblings that have all, you know, done yeah. well too, et cetera. A little too tough, but in the long run, especially with the business I went into, it, it, it was a, I've been around tough minded people. Yep. You it, know, we need to get thicker skin in this society. It, it, yeah. It's uh, Tough is good. You know, strong men make yeah. good times. Good times make yeah. soft men. And it's, uh, yeah, no. it's been unfortunate. Was, I can remember working in the garage and then I'm out. I go to college. I come home one weekend and he shows me the uh, labor manual uh, for garage work services. And the labor had gone up to $27 and 50 cents an hour. And he looked at me and he said, Dick, no man's worth $27, 50 cents. <laughs> Consequently, he never had any money because he never charged, never charged enough. Yeah, he never charged him enough money for the, the jobs that he did, you know, and money wasn't important to him. It was about yeah. delivering the results to people and yeah. helping people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A man of his word, you know, his handshake was his bond, I suppose, you yeah. know, uh, and then, you know, I, I'm a big 10 guy. I'm a, unfortunately this year, I'm an Iowa, not unfortunately this year, I've always been an Iowa Hawkeye fan Iowa. and it's been a challenge this year with the offensive yeah. woes, et cetera. But, uh, it made me happy that, uh, you took the Bruins and, and put a beat down on Ohio state in, in 76 when you won the Rose bowl, that, that was really? uh, quite great. Now I was there 10 years later at the 86 Rose bowl when I wasn't happy that the Bruins beat Iowa. <laughs> But uh, man, it was fun to watch. You might have. Were you? Did you announce that Rose Bowl in '86? Uh, let's see. Who was it? It was UCLA against Iowa. Iowa was favored. No. No. I did. Did uh, Ohio State, Arizona State Rose Bowl in a national championship game. Yep. Did I did a Michigan 
a Rose Bowl game. I think those are the only two that I can remember right off the top of my head. Yeah, and then yeah. you you spent all that time. Were you with Musburger most of the time, Brent? Is that college ball? Uh, eight eight or nine years. Yeah. 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 ABC. And then you did some CBS work too. I know. Years with them. Yeah. yeah. So tell me a little bit about the the journey to the Eagles because you were brought in. I mean, to to fix some bad problems everywhere you you went in the NFL. And he had fantastic results. Some years, uh, incredible, right? A world championship, Super Bowl win in in uh, ninety uh, ninety nine with the uh, with the St. Well, Louis Rams. You know, very seldom do you get hired to take over a winning team. <laughs> Isn't that the <laughs> truth? <laughs> and uh, I sort of enjoyed, you know, as I look back on it now, if I had a choice, I would rather take a losing team over than a team that's been winning all along. They listen better. They listen better, you know, and uh, and they they don't have the second guesser saying, no, we never did it that way. We won 10 games last year, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. To the kids. But what you need is total cooperation throughout the entire building. You've got to bring the people together as much as you bring the team together and get everybody functioning as one organization with one purpose develop a winning football team and it's not about power it's not about control but if you work with the right people they'll recognize who is capable of making the right decisions they build trust and, yeah builds oh, trust the first two jobs i had in the nfl i had 51 percent vote on all in all football things you know and when you stop with the nfl football team is that they're about football but I didn't have to worry about the business sides of it and the contract sides. I would have a say in it and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I could say, don't pay that guy. You know, yeah. oh, I'm going to run him. Uh, those kinds of things. But the personnel decisions, the hiring and the firing of coaches and uh, the support staff that direct daily with your football team. I had control of that. And, it's not, and it wasn't about power or ego. I just... You know, like Bill Parcells says, if you're going to cook the meal, you better buy the groceries, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he said it somewhere like that. I just, you know, my football, assistant football coaches were like a board of directors. We did it all together. Which I had the and coach, but I very seldom made a decision without that consensus of the rest of my staff. Every once in a while you have to, you know, but. Uh, yeah, sometimes you got to make the tough decision, but when you've built belief and trust and, and everybody's buying in, you kind of naturally gravitate to the same decision. Anyway, the consensus is yeah. uh, easier to come to because everyone's on the same page. And you know, the other, they expect you to make the right decision. Yep. Yep. Leadership then, isn't, yeah. Leadership isn't easy. You know, people look at it and go, it, it'd be great to be the boss. Right. Yeah. But it, it comes with burdens. It comes with, you know, a, a tremendous yeah. amount of accountability and responsibility. You know, if the, if the well, team loses, but, they don't fire the whole team. They fire the coach. Yeah. So, you know, you know, it's, 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 they're getting better at it now, but it's like, like I just went in the NFL hall of fame, but in the last 25 years, I only put 10 guys in, but all those coaches, there's been a lot of coaches fired. Yep. Okay. That's right. Hundreds of firings and 10 put in. They take, and the, blame. They take the blame. Yep. Yep. When, the, when they get the credit, but as soon as it goes just a little sour, it's, it's all the head coaching, so they fire him. You know? yeah. that, that's anyway. one of the things I've liked about uh, being a Hawkeye fan. You know, we've only had two head coaches since 1979. Yeah, and you've got a great one there right now. I know. At Ference is very, yeah. very good. Hey, Bill Snyder came out of there. That's a, so did um, uh, Bill Snyder and then the Stoops brothers. Uh, yeah. You had Bob Stoops. Bill, you have Mark yeah. at Kentucky. You had, um, oh, gosh, the, uh, the AD. Uh, up at Wisconsin and the head coach of Wisconsin, Barry Alvarez. Barry. Yeah. They, yeah. I mean, well, you, that coaching staff in 1981 has five hall of fame college coaches on it. I know it. Well, in my opinion, Bill Snyder is one of the two finest football coaches. I ever watched coach football. Okay. And he, but he, I met him when he was an offensive coach at Iowa. Yeah. Before he became the head coach. Yeah. Before he went yeah. to Kansas state. Yeah. He's a good man. Uh, they are all good men. You know, Hayden, Hayden surround himself. Talk about just a great character. He embraced oh, uh, Iowa, came out of Texas, you know, did some great things around diversity before he came up and 
we hadn't had a winning season in 25 years. You know, we won three national championships in the 50s, and then we didn't win anything in the 60s and 70s. I know. And uh, my dad and mom went uh, to games for 50 years. They had, you know, tickets for 50 years. So it, it's yeah. in our blood. Yeah. What was it like, um, you know, you had a movie made uh, called Invincible that kind of mm-hmm. handled the Eagles. You know, you came in and the strike situation hit. And mm-hmm. uh, you coached, got them all the way to the Super Bowl, which they hadn't been in playoffs for years and years and years. What was it like handling that strike? And then, you know, you had uh, Vince uh, Papali, um, that part of the story. And I know you've said that movie yeah. has got well, some Vin- areas. Vince wasn't there when we had the strike. He'd already been, well, he was there three seasons. Okay. It was before that. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. He, before that, the strike was difficult in that our owner, Leonard Tose at Philadelphia uh, was short of money and he needed the gate receipts week in and week out to pay the bills and do the things you had to do to run a pro football team. Yeah. So that really hurt him dramatically. He had his own faults in business practices and other things, but he was a good man. And, but that strike really, really hurt him in the 82. And he was dead against giving the players a percentage he was dead against that, and uh, uh, it was the only team, only time I've ever been around an owner that really got upset with his players, you know, and, and addressed them accordingly, and 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 showed his anguish, and and that, and it it, it hurt the team a little bit. Was he, that he recovered from? But uh, he never recovered financially from it. Was that kind of the? the impetus or why you kind of stepped away. I know it, I think it said you were just kind of burned out or something, but what, what was the reasoning to kind of step into the broadcast booth? Well, I got, I got, so the thrill of the wind didn't last very long and the agony of the feet lasted forever. Uh, and in losing, it would negatively influence my preparation to win the next one. And I found myself, you know, I, I kept pushing myself into a hole of staying sleeping in the office or working more hours. Well, you know, uh, you know, if I, if I, last week I worked at two o'clock in the morning and we lost, maybe I better work to three o'clock in the morning, you know, yeah. morning and that kind of stuff. And it was a, uh, self-destructive mood. I just, just insecure enough myself in my own career at that time to not listen to people that told you, you can't keep doing that. Yeah. Work you know, life, work life balance is, is hard, and and coaching has got the worst work life balance out there. I mean, it's it's the oh. career, you know, the recruiting, not in the but in the pros, you're looking at draft and and uh, film, and you know, it's twenty four seven. You sleep in the no, office, yeah. There's no such thing as balance coaching in the NFL. Yep, you're kidding yourself if you think there is. Yeah, but yeah. in terms of comparing your occupation with other occupations, okay, yeah. It, yeah, no. it, it's it's a battlefield, and it's a continual, and it's gotten like I said, so much more intense today than ever before. But the money involved. Well, you it's know, funny it, you br- you brought that up uh, when we were talking here a couple weeks ago that you went in the broadcast booth. They play, paid you twice as much for only sixteen weekends of work, or so I forget what you said exactly, but it was. Yeah, I went from making seventy five thousand dollars a year salary to one hundred and fifty. Think Coaches about that. Were in- you know, I had a number of head coaches tell me this. We're good friends. That for a long time, coaches were a necessary evil in the league. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody uh, on the football team was making more money. Okay, most of them anyway. Yep. <laughs> yep. But uh, oh. you know, it's better today. It's it, it's tremendous today. Oh, and absolutely. I, I, everyone's making a lot more money. But uh, to me, see, I never had a football agent. I never wanted anybody between me and the owner. What an incredible <laughs> thing to think about in today's world. Yeah. Or, or I, I just, I just never did it. That wasn't me. That's it. And I just took what they are. I remember when I took the head coaching job at UCLA, I flew to San Francisco, met with JD Morgan, came home, walked in the house, getting ready to go to practice for the Rams because I was still working for them. Yeah. Well, Dick, how much money we're we going to make? I said, I don't know. I didn't ask. <laughs> Twenty-seven thousand five hundred. Twenty-seven thousand five hundred dollars to lead a Pac-12 powerhouse 
yeah. in the 70s. Yeah. That's unbelievable. When we won the Rose Bowl and beat Ohio State, J.D. Morgan called me and he says, you know what, I'm going to give you a raise. So he moved it to 32-5. <laughs> what a great guy, right? Oh, man. Yeah. They, just, they just didn't pay coaches in those days. Yeah. Now, they're not, those departments were making the money they did now. You know, there are coaches making eight, nine million a year in college right now. Oh yeah. yeah. And to be in the top, uh, be in the top 10, you got to crack seven and a half million dollars a year in total income opportunity. Yeah. And it, no, it was all, I wouldn't change a thing. The only thing I would change is I would have an agent yeah. represent me. Yeah. You no, know, uh, it may be, it's, uh, it's not ignorance. It's just a value system. Yep. I did. I stayed with my innate ingrained value system and i just i didn't want you know i didn't like an agent telling me what a football player i was coaching was worth so i didn't want an agent telling the owner what dick for meals worth yeah let dick show you what i'm worth I didn't know, yeah i never conversations yeah it is it has changed for sure and so then yeah. you did uh was it 16 years in the broadcast booth 14 14 years in the broadcast booth and then the uh, the greatest show on turf came calling, and they needed you to. Well, not yet. They had a problem, and they needed to fix it. And um, your uh, your starter got hurt, and then uh, a young Iowa kid named Kurt Warner was there, and you took him and won a yeah. Super Bowl. I mean, tell us about yeah. those three years that, a little bit. That was the third year. Yep. My first two years with three different NFL teams, we won between 35 and 38% of those games. Our third year, we won over 70% of our games. That's awesome. And I like that process because I could build mm -hmm. it. My staff and I together in the audience could build what we wanted. You know, like I said earlier, it's not like taking a team that's been in the playoffs every year. Mm -hmm. The only thing that satisfies them is the Super Bowl. But when your goal is to only win one more game than you won last year, and take it that way, then all of a sudden you're in the playoffs your third year at all three teams. Uh, all of a sudden, your credibility is so much deeper, like you already said, because it hadn't been done before. Yeah, the belief just they, they start looking around going, This is incredible. I, I think, like I, I, yeah, the fellowship, the fellowship for you just increases tenfold. Yeah, yeah, no question. Oh, and then, um, you, you stepped away again and then came back for the chiefs. What, what did you just feel you didn't, you had something left to give or what, what caused now, you to come back to the chiefs? I left the Rams because I wanted to come home and be with my, you know, my kids are having grandchildren moving around here and, and all they say, and I'm not part of it. Yeah. And I, I wanted to be with them. And I figured I'd have a coach of the year trophy. I got in 1979 and most of the coaches names on that trophy that got it before me at all lost their jobs by being fired. And I, I didn't want to have my name on a coach of the year trophy and get fired. <laughs> I said, Hey, no matter how good you get, Tom Landry gets fired. You know? yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Don Shula got fired. Jimmy coach, Johnson. You know? Yeah. As going through yeah, all Bill of the, Pelican yeah. Fired. Yep. Jimmy Johnson fired. <laughs> and I thought, well, hell shit, go out on top. Go out, <laughs> go out on your I'm terms. Like, damn it. Wanna, That's right. And the kids wanted me home. So I went home and, when I went back in May to give out the Super Bowl rings at the big party, yep. myself, as I handed the ring to each coach and each person, each player, I'd say, what the hell did I do? I spent three years helping rebuild an organization that was the losingest team in football in the 90s to a world champion in three years. And we only had nine guys on the roster left of the one we took over. We built it. The whole thing. It, yeah. Hey. And uh, I said, what the, what a, what a foolish mistake well i made a mistake i'm gonna move on then i get a call from carl peterson president of the chiefs for 18 or 19 years at that time had worked for me at ucla had worked for me at the eagles he said coach i offered you this job in 1989 it wouldn't come and uh i'm offering it to you again and lamar hunt would like to have it they flew into town here and we talked and all of a sudden they're gonna pay me they're gonna pay me salary that i never made before yeah. i said you know something I miss it. I'll go do it. And it was a, one of the best decisions I ever made. That's awesome. Who was, yeah. was that, who was your quarterback then on the chiefs? We traded and brought Trent green with me who we got hurt at yep. the Rams. Yep. Gotcha. I like, I admired him. I just, 
liked him as a person. I liked him as a player, and he, he was really unheralded. You know, he, he didn't start in the games until like seven years. Yep. And he stayed took over as, as a backup quarterback, became started due to injury at Washington, and played, I thought, played well. So we signed him as a free agent to come and play for the, and our third year. And then, he, you know, the story goes, he got whacked, you know. And yeah, yeah. I enough to bring him uh, with me. And I had that kind of uh, influence. Yep. And brought him and he, he did a great job. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. I want to touch, you know, I know we, we, we've got about 15 minutes left to hear because I know you're, you're busy. And first of all, congratulations on the Hall of Fame. Also Thank Rose, you. also Rose Bowl Hall of Fame. I think in 2014 you were awarded that too. So, yeah. dual Hall of mm-hmm. Fame, Super Bowl winner, two Super Bowls played in, one half of them, uh, which is uh, uh, simply incredible. And you've you've gone in, and I want to get to your seven leadership principles to finish on here. But I do want to give you a chance to talk about your your love that you're that you're engaged with right now in life, and and talk about the Vermeil wines, which are absolutely outstanding for those of you that haven't <laughs> haven't had them. But tell us about the wine a little bit. Yeah, well, they are good wines, you know, but I don't make the wines. I'm not a winemaker. You know, it's something I, when you're born and raised in Calistoga, the north end of the Napa Valley, yep. you're automatically, your friends are with it. And at, at that time, there was many prunes in the vineyards. Uh, at, there was as many prunes in Calistoga as there were vineyards. Minute, new graduate, you know, my I, my grandfather, Vermeil, would uh, make our family wines, and we would pick the actual parts of the vineyard that my great grandfather owned uh, for a, a period of time out of the Freddie Annie vineyards, you know, yep. which is, which anyway, I just had the interest and in, uh, I said, someday I'd like to put my dad, Jean-Louis Vermeil and my great grandfather's name on a wine bottle because it was such an important thing in our family. That's wonderful. And, uh, I went to a friend uh, who was married into the Freddie Annie family, my the close family to me. And, he had a little winery called On the Edge Winery. And I said, Paul Smith, how about making some Vermeil wine, Cabernet? And and I, we talked about it. I said, I don't want to put any money in it, but it, it just make it as a hobby. He said, I'll do it and I'll sell it as my Cabernet. Okay. So he puts a John Louis Vermeil label on. My wife's friend in St. Louis painted the label from the village in France where the Vermeils come from. How cool is that? And it was 1999, and well, we win the Super Bowl. He, we made 150 cases or a little more, and he sold them all right away. And he said, "Well, you know something? Let's. I'll just keep that name on my my Cabernet, uh, and we'll keep doing it." And we kept doing it, and eventually, some friends of mine with a lot of money, entrepreneurs, came to me and said, "You have all the connections. You've been involved with this hobby." He says, uh, "Let's turn it into a business." So I said, if that's what you want to do, okay. So they bought out the little on the edge winery, everything they had in the barrels. Yep. And, and bottled it then on as Vermeil. And then 2008, we came out with the true Vermeil wine, made as Vermeil wine, you know. Yep. And made about 2,000 cases of a blend that year and then kept on going. Now we're making about 2,000 cases a year, but we make three, three Cabernets. We make a a Chardonnay, with which the grapes come from Sonoma County, Dutton Ranch. We make a Sauvignon Blanc, a Zinfandel, you know, and, and a little Syrah, a little Charbonneau. But we're really known for our Cabernets. You know, we make three cabs from the same Freddie Annie vineyard. And uh, we get outstanding. We get 95, 93, 96 grades on them. They're wonderful. They're wonderful. Yeah, and, but I, I'm sure as hell not a winemaker. I go out and drive tractors to harvest, which I really enjoy. Yep. And we go to work at seven in the morning. We're usually finished by noon. And sometimes it's all six days. Sometimes it's only three days this week and the, you know, five days next week, depending when the wineries want the grapes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And turn it in. It's, it took 12 years to put it. So it uh, it's in the black, you know, it, it, it makes a little money, not a lot. We have a tasting room in, in Cal in Napa. We had one in uh, Calistoga too. We sold it. The one we have in Napa, we just leased the facility. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's, I enjoy it. I need something to be doing every day. Yeah. And I, already uh, two weeks ago, we were in Rye, New York, and put on two big wine dinners at country clubs. And I have one coming up at State College, Pennsylvania, a week from Friday. And, uh, you know, I have two uh, what we call uh, tastings via Zoom uh, 
with Rico Company. Yep. Uh, you did that with I'm, me. Yep. A couple of weeks already. ago, I was the I, I emceed that one with you. That's how we got connected here, and right. the, so, the customers know, love it. Yeah, but I, but I am no. I don't have a sophisticated wine palate. I know what I like, and I know what good wine is, and I know what the processes are, and what kind of just like you, you know. I you always know you need a good quarterback. Well, you better have a good one. You better have. <laughs> a good winemaker and you you need good grapes so you better right. have a good person that's right you know, now you do know. you have a house out there too or just in philly no, good have but i don't yeah yeah well, that's all right go out and visit well that's wonderful like well and staying busy is great you know it's it's how you it's how we all stay sharp etc you know we're, we're coming here on the on the 10 minute mark and i do want to be very respectful because i know you got a big event uh in downtown philly tonight but yeah. i did oh, want to yeah. i'm sorry I'm going down to the Union League. They're honoring a former player of mine that became very successful in terms of developing a whole program that took care of the the minorities in North Broad Street and that section of Philadelphia. And it was, yeah. What a great Called event. Oh, you know, my yeah, dad used to did. say, it's not what you have, it's what you give, right? And it doesn't need to be monetary, but your time, your patience, right? Yeah, he passed away a few months ago, and we're honoring him tonight at the Union League in Philadelphia. Oh, well, that's too bad, but I'm I'm sure he's looking down and, and very appreciative of it. the the well, last The last few heaven. minutes, I'm sorry. If anybody's going to go to heaven, it would be him. That's okay. awesome. That's awesome. You're hanging with good people, hopefully by association. Yeah. That's how I look at it. Hang out with good people, and hopefully by association, they call me up there too. Um, you bet. I wanted to talk about your leadership principles and let you just kind of talk through that a little bit because. I know it, it, it's been through your coaching life, your business life, your personal life, and they really resonated with me. That's why I reached out. And again, thank you so much for spending time with me. But I wanted to give you a few minutes to kind of talk about how you, you, know, you develop those and, and what those are and just kind of talk through them for the, for the audience because well, they're great. Having coached for 35 years in high school, junior college, college and pro football as an assistant coach and a head coach at every level, you have a lot of time to think and you, you make mistakes and you correct them. And many mistakes made by leaders is in communication. It's not in lack of knowledge or anything like that. It's just how they teach it, how they present it uh, and the, the whole thing. And I, I've kept recognizing certain things that work better than other pro approaches. And you could be on a coaching staff with 10 guys and they're all different. Yep. You know, I just, I just started out, you know, when it's all said and then when I got out of coaching, I said, what helped me the most in being successful? And I, you know, not with an ego thought or anything. I said, you know, I think probably it was because my players knew I cared about them. What a great idea. So that's why you know, people got to know you care, you know, and that doesn't mean you're not tough on them. You don't chew their ass out you know, or anything like that. You're doing things to help them be the best they can be. You know, and that if they know you don't care, you're talking to a closed door. That's right. You know? That's right. And, and they've got to see that in you. That's why I came out and with my coaches. And when when I was assist, they got to see in me what I'm talking to them about. So you got to be a good example. You know, like I've said many times, your team will not be what you aren't. Yeah. You know? What a great <laughs> statement. You know, yeah, it's just you know, your people have to see in you what you want them to be. Lead you know, by and example. Then, yep. And then, and then, yeah, I, I, you move from there and you say, well, well, you're with these kind of guys. Well, let's make sure when they walk in your building or walk on your field that the atmosphere is positive, that they enjoy being there, even though they know they're going to have to work their butts off today. That okay. the atmosphere is good, and, and uh, that it just it just adds a dimension to the locker room it adds a dimension to the meeting room it adds a dimension to the practice field it adds a big dimension game day they enjoy being involved with rico they enjoy being involved with hillsdale high school you know yeah and then you, you define why in the hell you're there you give them a purpose you give them a process you know you, you give them standards to meet you know and then uh it, it just but it, again, they have to see that in you. You can't say one thing and do another. Yeah, that's right. But as long as they understand and they trust you, then whoever you delegate responsibilities, they will trust them. Now, sometimes you find out you delegated the responsibility to someone who can't handle it or can't do it the way you would like it to do. So you make a change. 
But then the next thing we did is we made sure they knew hard work was not a form of punishment. I think that's a great line. It's not a form of punishment. You know, actually, it's the means to the reward, right? No, it's the solution. Yep. Like I tell guys, it's your ally. You, You should be glad you walk off the field exhausted because you now know you just made a contribution to getting better. That's right. And there's a move in the, you, know, you can't work NFL teams like we used to work them. And I think it's going to be better in the long run for CTE complications and later life for the guys who play a long, long time. But uh, you could not do in a, on a, with a team today what we did in Philadelphia or what we did in St. Louis. In Kansas City, I modified it. In Kansas City, I used the approach we used my third year at the Rams. But anyway... The little pain, a little adversity, the hard work, that's how it all happens. You make average players better. You make good players better than average. You make great players Hall of Famers or, or all pros. You know That's right. And then you, with this, though, and with the whole process, you put it together and you build relationships. I used to tell my guys, we're going to make, uh, to my coaches, we make them better on the field. We make them happy off the field. Okay, but when they walk on that field and they walk in those meeting rooms, it's what we have to do to get better. It's go time. That's right. You have to. You have to. One hundred percent in. One hundred percent in. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in the off season uh, with my players. I think my wife has probably fed ninety percent of the kids I ever coached in our house. What a wonderful got, attribute! Yeah. Well, I taught a lot of kids in pro football how to drink wine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> two of them two of them are limited partners in my wine business, Trent Green and Todd Gollins. Okay. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. And you know, and I, I taught them, you know, if you really feel strongly about somebody, make sure you let them know. I I I introduced in the locker room a lot of guys the word love, you know. Now it's not the same kind of love, yeah, emotionally as you have for your own kids or your or your wife or thing like that. But it's a hell of a lot deeper than just respect. Hell, you can work with people you respect you don't like. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. But when uh, you know the first coach that I ever worked with that said, I love you, Dick, was Bill Walsh said that to me. And it's absolutely startled me in a positive way. And yeah. I said to myself, well, if that affected me as much as it did, I wonder if it would affect you sincerely, other people that I work with, that you feel strongly about this kid. Share the gift. I, yeah, share the gift that Bill gave be, you. Yeah. They don't have to be first string. They don't have to be all pro. They could be the third string right guard, you know. <laughs> but it's about the kind of person he is and then what he's doing with his opportunities, what he's doing with his innate abilities, what he, what he's, how he's living his life. And you know, sometimes you just can't help yourself. That's kind of the Kurt Warner story. You know, I mean, he wasn't a starter. He was a nobody. I mean, it. Well, I'll tell you, the last thing Kurt Warner says to me on a phone call or a text message is, is, I love you, coach. That's awesome. He's good. He's a good man. You know, and and do do you, I was going to ask you this question and I'll let you finish on that. Do you think the, um, the arena league, the, the, the pace of play and things that he had done before allowed him to just be able to see fast? I mean, because the greatest show on turf, you guys were so explosive. Yeah, well, think- Mike Mark did a beautiful job with the offense, you know, and I brought him in there the third year, and we had built a foundation around doing a lot of things well, but we had to improve. And, of course, we also drafted Corey Holt and brought in, you know, and Kurt Warner ends up being what he was, and uh, Marshall Falk, and, and I brought in Al Saunders and, and John Matsko and Dana LaDuke. I, I had about five first-round picks, only one of them was a football player. So they all made contribution but mike marks was the catalyst for that he, he put the package we've been building to two years That's together a great story like he uses the term he says well coach you had the table set <laughs> that's wonderful well again it's back yeah. to the village right everybody had their their component to make yeah. it work the, the yeah the, if all the sprockets aren't on the wheel the wheel doesn't work right and no that's right it wobbles yeah and it's just great that it happened i didn't mean to interrupt your your role on your no, your last right. principles the last thing I was, and you know, the last thing is you got to, you got to be sincere. You've got to tell the truth, even when it hurts. You know, there's an old saying that I use, I read for somebody said, if you have integrity, nothing else matters. If you don't have integrity, 
nothing else matters. <laughs> and any organization, any team, I have this RICO or any, when the leader lies to the students or lies to the employees, to one person, it goes around that building, it goes around that locker room, and in one hour, everybody knows the coach line. Yeah, so we we prided ourselves in being as honest. And if you couldn't be honest, then you, you didn't say anything. Yeah. That's right. If you, that yeah, there is are so times, good. You know, yeah. Well, I just, uh, you know, wonderful um, contribution from you, Coach. I, I just think the world of you being a Midwest kid when you were coaching the Rams in St. Louis and the Iowa connection and and uh, building what was broken into into great things. When I reached out to you, I I just I couldn't believe you were so willing to help and uh, and yeah. give me some time. You, you send, me, send me your email, and I will send you a written copy of what we're talking about. That'd be wonderful. I appreciate it so much, and I'll share some more of those attributes uh, with the with the crew out there as we as we continue on this thing. People, not many. What's that? Because it's and I I update it all the time. That's awesome. Because I, for example, on the left right here, left, I just, I'm into the book called The Generals. It's about Patton, MacArthur, and Marshall. Yep. You know, and, and it adds depth to how, how you think about leadership. I was yeah. a military history major uh, in college. Yeah, but oh, Patton was dyslexic. <laughs> yeah, or as they say, Lex Dixick, I see everything backwards. <laughs> But anyway, well, I appreciate uh, it. I will reach out to you, coach. Uh, maybe, right. maybe ask down the road for, uh, for another bit of time, but Hey, sure. thank you so much. Uh, you know, again, coming up in December. I will, I will. And I, I appreciate you giving time and, yeah. uh, give a listen to the podcast. Give me some feedback. I need some feedback from, uh, from true professionals like yourself and stay yeah. healthy and, and stay wise like you are. And again, congratulations on the hall of fame. We greatly appreciate it. Have a wonderful night, and, and good luck uh, celebrating your buddy's life that has uh, unfortunately passed. I appreciate the time. Take care. Thanks, sir. Have a great day. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. Hey, we just finished up with Coach Vermeil. What a, what a wonderful human being, as you can tell. And uh, just, man, sharp as a tack, uh, going on 87 years old, and I think could still go out and and motivate a team and, and, and uh, suit him up on the field. But a consummate gentleman. Uh, uh, I mean, a football brain like no others, and think about the things he accomplished. Hall of Fame, um, Rose Bowl coach, Hall of Fame NFL coach, two Super Bowls, won one of them, coach of the year at the high school, junior college, college, and professional levels. You can't be much better than that. And as you can also tell, he's very humble. And uh, what a great, great thing to uh, to have as an attribute on that. So we will continue. This is the Leadership Lounge. We want to thank everybody. Remember, we can be uh, uh, checked out at www.drleadershipresults.com. That's the website. And also, we can be reached at uh, drleadershipresults at gmail.com. And I just have to uh, say one last thing to everybody. Remember this. You're awesome. Keep that shit up. Talk next week. Mm -hmm.